Good evening. We're on the air with another edition of Patients on the News, and I'm very happy that we have on the program tonight one of the most insightful people I know around here, Greg Kesich, who for many years was the uh, editor of the editorial pages of the, um, of the Portland newspapers, and um, a friend of mine, and a guy who knows a lot, and I used to read his editorials all the time. Now he's retired. <laughs> and you've all missed him. I know you've missed him. You said, mm -hmm. what's happened to Kesich? Where is he? Uh -huh. uh, I actually do know a couple people who said that. Uh -huh. One of them who's very conservative, uh, right-wing guy, who Greg made sure got to tell his story occasionally on the editorial yeah. page. And I'm sure he misses you, Greg. Uh, but anyway, here we are. Election Day was yesterday. We get the results today, most of them, and uh, we're here to talk about it. Not like those pundits do on TV. They're boring. You know, they give you all this an analysis. Well, you know, we're going to just react to things and, and uh, talk in, about it in, in, in discussion mode. And uh, I hope those of you who want to discuss, we, we used to have... A, technology here where you could call in, but I didn't like that because I spent my whole time listening to people tell me why I was wrong. And, you know, I <laughs> who come, needs to hear that? You know, who wants to yeah. hear that? Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, right. anyway, so, Greg, what do you Harold. think? What happened here? I, I, I wrote you a note last week produce, predicting a top-to-bottom total smashing uh, you know, uh, result in favor of the Republicans across the country, top to bottom. What happened? And I didn't, uh, I didn't say you're wrong. It's yeah. going to be a, a stalemate. We're going to be about where we uh, thought we would be a year ago. Yeah. But um, uh, that's what happened, is that um, uh, there was an expectation that uh, Republicans were going to uh, there was going to be a red wave, and Republicans were going to sweep into uh, all the high offices. You did say you didn't think uh, Paula Page was going to win. I did not. Um, uh, and uh, you and you also said that the um, uh, Bolduc in was going to lose the Senate race in New Hampshire, but that was about it. And um, what happened is uh, we have a, a very rigid system right now. Uh, we don't have landslides like uh, we once had. Um, uh, Lyndon Johnson winning, what, 64 percent of the vote in 1964. The biggest landslide of all, I think. Uh, in, in percentage, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, Reagan and Nixon both won 49 states. Like, right. But that doesn't um, seem even possible now. It's hard. You couldn't even imagine uh, anybody putting that together. So there's fewer seats at play, partly because it's structural, partly because, uh, you know, of gerrymandering and things like that, So, the, but also because of the way... Um, our politics have become so polarized and so rigid that there isn't really room for a, uh, a big wave election uh, the way we might have seen them in the past. And uh, I think that's what happened. Everybody kind of performed the way you would have expected them to perform if you hadn't been expecting um, uh, some big transform transformative change election. Interesting uh, take, and I hadn't thought much about that, but that's true. Uh, it is Yankees and the Red Sox now, and yeah. everybody's armed. Yeah, and uh, yeah, right. So, they're both winning nine, you know, nine games a year against each other. So, so it's close. It was essentially uh, a, a tie, although uh, I think for sure the Republicans will elect a speaker and be in control of the House. I don't know how much control. Yeah, uh, but I'm, I, I've found something interesting today on the Daily Beast, a headline that said. We still don't know who won, mm -hmm. but the Republicans lost. Right. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. And I think they think they lost. Mm -hmm. And because uh, I think they thought they were going to have an overwhelming victory. But uh, this reminds me, this phrase, we still don't know who won, but the Republicans lost. In 1969, a, a very good Yale football team with a couple guys who were very successful in the pros was playing Harvard in the game. And surprisingly, in the last four minutes of the game, 
Harvard scored three touchdowns and tied the game, and it ended in a tie, 29-29. And the next morning, in the Harvard Crimson, the headline was, Harvard wins 29 to 29. Right. <laughs> yeah. This is what this situation uh -huh. is. So, uh, so. And why do we expect it to be more? I think uh, that's, a, that's worth looking at because uh, Republicans, I think, over, um, they, they set ex expectations very high. Uh, and so it looks like they lost when, when really they just made some incre incremental gains. Um, but it doesn't happen this way often that they, in the, after the first two years of a new president's no. uh, presidency, uh, the party out of power that, you, that controls the House, the Senate, and the White House usually loses a lot. Yes. Isn't that traditional? That's true. Uh, uh, Obama lost something like 60 seats. Uh, the Democrats lost 60 seats in 2010 yeah. uh, when Obama had his first midterm. Uh, I think in Bill Clinton's uh, first midterm in 94, um, which is an election that a lot of people have been talking about recently as the, as the, as the model for this year, um, uh, Clinton lost something like 50 seats uh, in the 40s, I think. So why did that, uh, so we had that plus a lot of people, the gas prices, they talk about yeah. gas prices as though, you know, we have total control over yeah. it. Uh, Get they constant, a lot of Republicans I heard, not just the people doing the ads, but people that I know, Republicans. What about the gas prices? What about inflation? Uh, we got to make a change in Congress to mm -hmm. do something about that. Uh, that didn't work. I thought it would. Um, yeah, I, maybe uh, this is a good time to like give voters some credit for um, understanding that a lot of these things are out of the control of the uh, people in the, who hold certain offices. Um, the other one is crime. Uh, you know, there's no question crime is going up. Um, uh, even here in Portland, I think there was uh, something like 40 uh, incidents involving guns in, the, in a 12-month period, which is a lot, you know, for a city like this. It and, is. Uh, um, but uh, I don't think Shelley Pingree uh, has anything to do with uh, the crime rate in Portland. Uh, not anything directly. I don't think um, right. uh, uh, get Jared Golden does, you know. I think um, that that people recognize, p perhaps you know. I think we need to talk to more voters and figure out what they were thinking. But for some reason, uh, those those issues didn't stick in the way that the uh, consultants believe that they would. You know, here's a. Uh, this is from the New Yorker mm. uh, a few days ago, and it says, "Why Republican insiders." think the GOP is poised for a blowout. <laughs> and then it says, in this article, uh, they interviewed a lot of people, the consensus among pollsters and consultants is this Tuesday's election will be a bloodbath for the Democratic Party. Uh -huh. So that was, I mean, that was their narrative, their message. Yes. And it was to totally wrong. Now, and I think they flooded the... Um uh, the market with uh, 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 very partisan polls that affected the, um, the the polling averages online that a lot of people like you and me read, yeah. um, and that affects um, the um, the attitudes of the people writing the stories, and um, and ha and then it has an effect on the people reading the stories. The, their their expectation is that uh, that uh, this is going to be a blowout. And maybe they don't go out and vote, or maybe they stay home. And then I don't think that's what happened. There's a, another very high turnout election. I think we've had three in a row. So today, this morning, I called my good friend Lou D'Alessandro, who was mm -hmm. a state senator in New Hampshire, the longest serving state senator. Uh -huh. I think he's won 18 straight elections in the New Hampshire legislature. He's a Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, Lou, what happened? And he said one word back to me, abortion. Yeah. And then he said, you know, that would, people talked about that a few months ago last summer after Roe, Wade, Roe versus Wade was overturned, and everybody said it's going to help the Democrats and their turnout. But now, for the last couple of months, People haven't talked about it at all. It's all been about the economy and so forth, and it's the economy stupid. 
Mm-hmm. Well, he said, let me tell you what I know about running for political office. Never say you are in favor of taking away something that individuals think is their right. Mm -hmm. And if it's an established right and you say you're going to take it away, you will get their attention. And that's what happened here. Huge numbers of women, particularly, made sure to vote and vote against the Republicans. I think you're right. Yeah. I think that's right. I, I talked to um, a Republican who had worked in campaigns uh, in Maine at the beginning of the summer, or maybe in June, and I said, you know, does LePage have a chance? And he said, I think he did until the Dobbs decision. And, um, and this was before the debates, and, and, it, and LePage could never really get a, um, a message on abortion that made any sense. And he didn't, want, he, he, he ran from it. And here's he an did. interesting quote. Yesterday, this is a quote from what he said last night. Oh, yeah. He said, uh, or maybe it was a quote he said before last night. If heating oil is not as important as abortion, then I'm telling you I should have never gotten into politics. Right. If heating oil is not as important as abortion. That was last night, yeah. That was last night. Yeah. So now I read maybe... Three months ago, not long after Roe versus Wade was overturned, that he said to a reporter, I don't want to talk about abortion. Yeah. So I, my theory was what's happened with all these Republican candidates, their, their handlers have told them all across the country, all the Republicans, just don't talk about it. Yeah. And that's, he took the, that advice. He didn't want to talk about it. He knew. I would say to you, he knew it was a hot issue. Yeah. And it was something to stay away from. Yeah, I'm sure they have polling and they, and they talk to people. Um, I thought one interesting thing about this campaign was how much um, under the radar it was for me. And uh, partly it's I, I retired in, um, in July, so I wasn't in the newsroom every day and living it. But also when I was driving around the roads, I didn't see so many signs. Um, uh, very few uh, people came to my door. Um, I didn't... Um, get a lot of mail and I, the impression I got was that the, can, the campaigns have gotten so sophisticated at identifying their voters and speaking directly to them through channels that aren't obvious to me, you know, that don't come across my desk, um, that that's the way they're doing it now. And I, I was wondering how they could be spending all this money and uh, I don't have any, you know, I never had any interaction with LePage campaign stuff. You, but you didn't watch enough television. I did. I watched the World <laughs> Series and I saw a lot of commercials then. Constant. But, uh, Constant. Yeah. And yeah. Sta- horrible things, lies about one another. Yeah. Really uh, unbelievable lies uh-huh. uh, in, these, in these ads. They just make up something. You yeah. know, um, uh, Governor Mills is handing out crack pipes right. to addicts. <laughs> yeah. You think people believe that? Some do, I guess. Otherwise, they wouldn't be putting it on the ads. It's like the way people believe in uh, professional wrestling. You know, they sort of do, but they, but you know, they uh, on some level they know it's not true, but they feel like there's something real there that that they they can relate Good to. Good point. Yeah. Good point. Well, uh, uh, let's turn. We're going to go back and talk about some of the national results in a few minutes, but let's talk a little bit about. Uh, Th- about this election in Maine, mm-hmm. um, I thought, and I t- you asked me, and I told you that I thought that Ma- Republicans would take the Maine legislature. Yeah, um, they didn't come close. No. In fact, the Democrats might have a bigger margin in the Senate when it's all over than they had when uh, last week, mm-hmm. and uh, the House is a little smaller. We we're going to have a Democratic speaker who will be from Portland uh, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, Rachel Talbot. Mm-hmm. And we're going to have the same Senate president who's from Aroostook County, who the Republicans spent a million dollars in northern Aroostook County. <laughs> One million dollars. There's only about 30,000 voters up there uh-huh. and uh, to defeat him. And he won. He did. And uh, he, <laughs> I'm told, I know him pretty well that as he was campaigning up there, he would see these prominent Republicans from southern Maine up there helping to organize the opposition to him. So they haven't endeared themselves uh-huh. to him, that's for sure. Uh-huh. <laughs> but but he, 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 you were ran these editorial pages. You've been here in Portland a long time. 
uh, I did a little analysis. Greater Portland uh, and just immediate suburbs. Yeah. So I looked at the results from Freeport to Scarborough, just the towns along the water, Freeport, Cumberland, Freeport, Yarmouth, Cumberland, Falmouth, Cape Elizabeth, South Portland, Scarborough, and I threw in Westbrook because it's so close. Uh -huh. So there's about 65,000 people voted in just those towns. We're not talking about Portland. 65, that's a lot of votes in the state of Maine. Yeah. And so uh, the, the results are unbelievable. Mills, uh, Mills carried uh, South Portland by 78%. She mm -hmm. got 78%, almost 80% of the vote in yeah, South yeah. Portland. Almost four out of five people in South Portland voted for Mills, just a little over 20% for, for LePage. Cape Elizabeth, same thing. 78% for Mills, 20%. In Cape mm -hmm. Elizabeth, yeah. that used to be a Republican it town. Um, Yarmouth, seventy-eight percent for Mills, twenty-one percent for for, for for LePage, and so it went through all of these towns. You know, the the the, the only one where LePage got uh, over thirty percent was Scarborough, yeah. and he got just thirty-three percent. Yeah. Mills got two-thirds of the vote, so. Won huge numbers of votes in yeah. these towns. Then you look at Portland, you add that in, yeah. the core yeah. of this strip, and uh, Mills got 87%. Yeah. 32,625 people voted in the gubernatorial election in the city of Portland. Yeah. 32,600. Yeah. She got 87%, almost all of them. Yeah. Almost all of them. Yeah, that's bigger than some counties in the second district. Bigger than, than some more, counties more in the state. Four or five, state. yeah. But yeah uh, you can take two or three of those counties and it would be yeah. bigger than three of them combined. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I looked at uh, what LePage got in draw votes in Portland was something like about 2,000. And um, remember back in 2010, uh, during the Republican primary, Peter Mills was campaigning a lot in Portland. And I ran into him on the street. I said, what are you doing here? You know, there's no Republicans here. And he said, oh, no, there's more Republicans in Portland than any town in the state. There's, there's, uh, there's more Republican votes. And I, every year after that, I've looked it up. And he's right. Uh, and, and I think LePage in 2014 got something like 8,000 votes in the city of <coughs> Portland. Um, and this time, uh, something under 3,000. You know, so exactly. Really, you know, so he wasn't able to kind of put enough of a, a foothold down here um, uh, to avoid, you know, what, what, what happened. You know, you look at these statistics from this mm -hmm. election for Greater Portland. Yeah. And there are a lot of Republicans around and a lot of moderates. Yep. And it, it, uh, the Republicans have got to have a plan because unless they have a plan on how to improve their performance in this general area, Greater Portland, they'll never win. Right. They can't win. They oh. got to get some votes here. Susan Collins did. Susan Collins did. Collins could. She won. She won York County, and she um, she was even in a lot of these yeah. towns. And I think she won Scarborough. But um, you wonder what the Page's plan was, or the Republican well, Party's plan plan was, for this problem in Portland. I think that's what the um, the Immigrant Welcome Center that he opened up on uh, Congress Street was about. Yeah. It wasn't about winning over immigrant votes. It was about. Uh, trying to uh, convince moderates and independents that um, he was uh, friendly to immigrants and, yeah. um, and, and try to hold on to some of those suburban votes. So, but we still have the same general blue-red map in Maine. Yeah. Immediate coast, yeah. just the immediate coast, all the way up to, to Washington County before it gets to Washington County. It always looks the same. It always looks the same. Yeah, yeah. Goes inland a little bit. Um, uh, around here, uh, Mills barely carried Wyndham. Mm -hmm. She carried Raymond. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that was interesting by just a few votes. She carried uh, Gorham quite significantly. Mm -hmm. She had uh, won that pretty easily. Uh, and then she barely lost Standish. But by the time you get to Standish, yeah. 
the de Democrats are dead. Right. By the time right, they right. get to Standish. Um, yeah, and she won Lewiston. And she won Lewiston and Auburn. Uh huh. And Auburn. Brakey, the Republican Senate candidate, won, but she carried uh -huh. Auburn. One other interesting thing, and this is, we're going to get into uh, demographics here, <laughs> but the, oh, there is a blue spot on this map, and it's around Bridgeton and Denmark and the towns on the New Hampshire border mm -hmm. around lakes where there's a lot of well-off people. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, up uh, not far from North Conway. Right. And that went for Mills. Yeah. And just that blue area over there. So do you think it has something to do when we're talking about demographics with, with education and uh, le le levels? You know, it was too early to say what the, what the breakdowns were in this election. Yeah. But in 2020 and, and previous, there's been this uh, growing split between um, polarization around college education. College educated people are more and more voting Democrat. When you talked about um, Cape Elizabeth and, um, and Falmouth being yeah. um, formerly Republican towns, back in those days, uh, people with college educations tended to be Republican. Correct. And, um, and that, there's been a real movement um, over to, to the Democratic Party. And um, there is a, um, uh, a, 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 a simultaneous movement. At first, it was just white, what they call white working class, which were... Um, people without a college degree uh, who were progressively getting more and more Republican. And there was some signs in the last couple of election cycles, I don't know about yesterday, but um, in 2020 and 2018, of, um, of black and Hispanic working class, particularly men, voting um, Republican, um, and for some of the same reasons. And that's, I think, the, uh, the key battleground uh, going forward. There's something like a third of the population has a college degree. And um, in politics, you don't want to be fighting over um, the third. You want to be getting a piece of the two-thirds. And there, uh, There's evidence of that fight because, you see, the, you, a lot of these Republican candidates, including LePage, uh, got people fired up about elitists. Yeah. That we're, we're, we're going to fight against the elitists. Right. And, and, it, and then it, what always interests me is that these are the same people who want to fight against the elitists are the ones who tell you that they're great patriots uh -huh. and they read the Constitution and, they, and they're very interested in the Constitution and they want to protect the Constitution and the founding fathers were brilliant. Uh -huh. The founding fathers were <laughs> to a man, and I say man specifically, to a yes. man, yeah. they were elitists. Uh -huh. Right. They were, they were clearly the elite of right. early America. Right. Uh, but they revere them, uh -huh. those elitists. They right. don't like the current elitists. But, yeah, it's... Yeah. It, 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 and, and, and so a lo so that same type of thing is uh, the rural-urban split, too, mm -hmm. because that's partly education-based. Yeah, it correlates, right? It correlates. Yeah, yeah. There's mo more college-educated people in the suburbs than in rural areas. Yeah. So... Um, <clears throat> What is this, you thought about at all what this means for President Trump? Because he said that he expects to announce his uh, run for the presidency next Tuesday, mm -hmm. the 15th. You know, I haven't, uh, to be honest, I haven't given it a lot of thought. Yeah. He, and he hasn't <laughs> Good called, for you. He hasn't <laughs> called me to, to ask for my <laughs> advice. I can't see why he would not run. He still has a very uh, enthusiastic uh, support. You know, it's really interesting. LePage sometimes refers to himself as Trump before Trump. And uh, it's a similar issue, right? I mean, that LePage um, has like a very loyal, enthusiastic support in Maine, and it's about 35, 38 um, percent of the electorate. And Trump has that same kind of chunk of the uh, Republican, uh, uh, or no, of the, of the national electorate, probably um, more than half of Republicans. Although I maybe, think it's, it's it's gone down a little bit. I think it's still over sixty yeah. percent of the Republicans when poll said love Trump. He's their guy. And um, and and then plus he's uh, facing some legal troubles, and he's found out that uh, it's harder to um, indict somebody who's president. 
So yeah. he's, got a lot, he's got a lot of personal interest. Well, and I think is one other thing. This is a guy who, um, who goes around calling people names, and one of his favorite names, he accuses people of being losers. Right. He's always talking about, that guy's a loser. Well, yeah. now he's a loser, and it must be eating at him, uh -huh. driving him crazy. I mean, when I say driving him crazy, he is a politician that actually does get yeah, driven yeah, yeah. crazy by these things. Yeah. That's not, I'm not just, a, you know, picking that word out of the, the atmosphere here. He's being driven crazy by being a loser. So he, he's going to prove that he's not a loser. And that's why he said that the, the election was stolen, because he really didn't lose. Didn't lose right. He can't stand the thought of it. Yeah, even the election he won, he said, was um, was fraud. Yeah, because he didn't get the popular. He vote. didn't get the popular vote. But you know, the thing I've always uh, believed and and observed is that uh, if the worst thing in the world for a politician is to lose an election, and uh, everybody uh, shuns them afterwards. You know, um, uh, you know, Michael Dukakis can walk the streets of Boston and nobody knows who he is. <laughs> right. Right. And. Um, uh, and I've never seen this before, where, where people uh, just double down and say that they're more enthusiastic about him. Have you ever seen that before, where, where somebody loses an election and, and they're not uh, blamed for uh, he's, uh, sinking he's, the ship? He, he, he's not blamed. He's still viewed as, in the, by some elements, as a heroic guy, yeah. uh, which I always think is funny. They, they, they do look him at it as a hero, and these are people, a lot of them are macho people, they love the military and so forth. This guy's a draft dodger, yeah. and you know, he's a draft dodger, they still love him. And he, because he spent his whole life as a carnival barker promoter, his whole life, everything he's done, uh, he does understand human nature. And he understands the worst parts of human nature, mm -hmm. understands it very well. So when he said, I could go out on Fifth Avenue and kill somebody and most of my supporters would not desert me, he, he was telling the truth. It's true. Yeah, yeah. It's true. Right. So, so, but now, so we both think he'll, he'll, he'll run. He feel compelled to run. Yeah. He can't walk away. Yeah. So it's become his business, right? And this is what he does for a living. Yeah, he makes money off it. Yeah, yeah. Makes money off it. He raises a lot of money. So, but this, he's going to have primary opposition. He's not going to go through without a primary because you got this guy down in Florida, at least, and maybe yeah. others, who's got to be saying to himself, strike while the iron is hot. Six years from now, I may be nothing. People will pay no attention to me. This is my shot. Mm hmm. Right, uh, you're talking about DeSantis. Yeah. And uh, you, when you said earlier, we don't know who won, but the Republicans lost. Um, I think you could say DeSantis won. Uh, uh, he has solidified uh, the state of Florida as a as a bright red state. It's mm -hmm. not a swing state anymore. It's not a bunch of um, you know transplanted Northerners. It's uh, it's got a it's got a very specific identity that's connected to this particular kind of right wing politics um, that. Um, Involves, you know, authoritarian rule, right? Uh, DeSantis uh, was in, had his hands all over the redistricting process. He um, made sure that that uh, Florida got four um, safe Republican seats out of it. Um, he, uh, he, you see, he's, he's firing uh, elected prosecutors, suspending them for not uh, enforcing the laws that um, he's pushed through the legislature regarding, you know, what people can teach in school and. Um, and um, prosecutors have said, you know, I'm not taking that case. You know, I, I've got enough to do. Yeah. And uh, which is usually the way it works, right? Is that they that they have some discretion, and he's uh, found a way, a loophole in Florida law where he can suspend them and and remove them from office, um, put and put his own people in place. I mean, this is a kind of um, uh, control that we are not used to seeing and and he's got it he's figured it out and, and a it, lot of people love it love it i look what he just he just won what is it 70 30. yeah uh and uh and he's puts in you know he's in the biggest uh, third biggest state uh going into the republican process but um you know what he doesn't have uh that trump has is this kind of charisma i like it's hard to imagine him filling a stadium uh, the but, way Trump can. But but what's he going to do when Trump has already started oh, on yeah. him? And uh, what he he called him, uh, uh, yeah, he said that on, on Monday night, 
Trump attacked DeSantis. Right. It's inevitable. It's typical. The night before an election day, it's very typical for the leader of your party <laughs> to attack a candidate <laughs> from your own party. Yeah. So, but is this typical? So he began a few weeks ago calling him Ron DeSanctimonious. Yeah. Clever. Yes. Clever. Ron DeSanctimonious. <laughs> uh, and then on Monday night, the, before the election, he was speaking to reporters on his plane and he threatened to release damaging information uh, about DeSantis should he run. Quote, this is Trump quoting on yeah. Monday night, the election eve. If he did run, run this, is a, this is a great Trumpism. Uh -huh. He did this all the time. If he did run, I will tell you things about him that won't be very flattering. <laughs> I know more, I know uh, more I. about him than anybody other than his wife. Yeah. To all the people who were, he knows more about it. And, and he says, uh, I think if he runs, it's a little warning, he could hurt himself very badly. Right, right. So it's starting. And he, um, he can't do it any other he, way. I think in that same quote, he had something about how uh, his wife is the one who really runs the campaign. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 So he's going to go at this guy yeah. tooth and nail. Now, Ron DeSanctimonious, uh -huh. he's got a problem because all these guys, all these Republicans have a problem. No matter what they think about Trump, mm -hmm. no matter how they want to go back at him, you've got to be careful because... The only way you can win is with Trump supporters. Mm -hmm. You need the Trumpists because he owns the party. It right. is the Trumpist party. Right. So if you want to be nominated in the Trumpist party, you've got to be careful what you say about Trump. Don't you think there's some truth to that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, and I think that's why he's been kind of uh, uh, not directly criticizing Trump and I think hoping that there's a void that he can step into. But... Um, you know, here we are. It's, it's uh, how many years in? Almost fifth, almost ten years in, and nobody's really figured out a good way to uh, to combat Trump. Like, no. if you if you sink to his level, uh, you just make yourself look small, and he's better at it. Um, if you if you ignore him, uh, that's another set of problems. Yeah, it's it's a uh, conundrum, for the, yeah. the, and I don't know how how, how uh, DeSantis is going to how he can possibly handle it. He needs. The Trumpist party. Uh -huh. Trump owns it. He needs it. How he's going to do it? And it's and it isn't that Trump is going to say something nasty about him every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. going to be constant. Give him a name. And, yep. But you know, um, I, I think one of the narratives coming out of last night is that um, the really hardcore Trumpists didn't do well, and that um, the uh, some of the really serious election de deniers, like I'm um, uh, forgetting General Bolduc in in New right. Hampshire. Um, de un underperformed compared right. to other Republicans. And I think the word is going to be out. Um, somebody's going to try to make the case that uh, he's dragging us down. We can have the same policies and we don't need him. We don't need his negative uh, force because he brings people out. Well, that would be the thing to say. And there are plenty of Republicans that will say those things. Yeah. Uh, but uh, if you're running for president in a Republican primary in yeah. Ron DeSantis, uh, how do you say something bad about Trump when you right. need his party? Right. He does, you do, said it earlier, we talked about over 50 percent, I think it's 60 some odd percent of the Republicans are devoted to him. Yeah. It's his party. We, I don't think there's ever been a case, of, I've been around a long time, I don't think Eisenhower, I don't think even Reagan had that kind of, you know, control yeah. over his own party. I, I know no Democrat ever did. Maybe Roosevelt in the beginning. But uh, isn't, there, isn't there a famous story of Roosevelt going on uh, campaigning against uh, Democrats who didn't, who were too conservative in, in the first midterm? And, um, and maybe, it was, maybe it was in 1938. Uh, anyway, they, they, they all won. And they yeah. all went back to Washington, and uh, he had to deal with them. And it was—he uh, learned his lesson. Oh, not that's to do a, that. I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, so, um, that's it a, was like that, you know he was—he was running against the uh, uh, the Southern um, uh, Dixiecrats, who uh, he needed, but um, he wanted to. You know, they weren't progressive enough. So look, but uh, 
there's, there's very likely to be this battle between at least DeSantis and Trump, if not more. Yeah. And um, oh, the other thing I want to say about the, um, you know, remember the, the last Republican primary, everybody seemed to be waiting for someone else to, to, to knock Trump out. Right. So that they could, like, step in. And that enabled him to go all the way, coast to coast. And uh, that's, so that's an issue, right? Like, that, that, somebody, that, nobody wants to be the one. The Republicans would love it if the Democrats got rid of Trump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, they'd really like him yeah. to go to jail. There's yeah. no question about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they pray for it. But, but look, Trump is going to do damage because he's going to go after him. He's going to call him a rhino. Yeah. You know, he's going to call him names. And the better that DeSantis as, as they get closer to the primaries, the better he is in the polls, uh, the more fired up Trump is going to get and the more vicious the things are, are going to be that he mm -hmm. says because he's going to panic because right. he cannot lose. He can psychologically, he, he cannot right. accept it. Right. So it, he's, he, he's really going to get wound up. And pe people, one person said to me, well, uh, he, he will have to be careful about the Republican Party. I said, do you, what human being who's <laughs> been paying attention to the last six years can believe that Trump is worried about doing damage to the Republican Party? Yeah. He only worries about himself. Right. Only. And everybody knows it. Nobody watching this television show, whether they love Trump or not, even those that have loved Trump, uh, would agree he only cares about himself. Yeah. That's obvious to any human being who got a brain. Yeah. So there's going to be trouble. There's going to yeah. be trouble. There's things there's going to be a dynamic here that's going to be pretty rough. I I think DeSantis, DeSantis is a pretty smart guy, but I don't know how he's going to figure out this one. No. Or uh, what about the um the likely Speaker of the House, um, McCarthy, McCarthy, is going to have a, uh, a caucus with uh, maybe 50, 100. Marjorie Taylor Greene is yeah. going to be an important part of his caucus. Right. She's got her followers. She is, and she's already said it. Uh -huh. They're going to pay attention to me. Yeah. And she's nuts. She is. <laughs> so she, she's nuts. And then, no and, offense and, to people with mental illness, and, but you know it's. And you know, Kevin it's, McCarthy it's, is not nuts. He right. wants to be speaker. He he's not be nuts. He's going to have to figure out how to handle her. Good luck to him, mm -hmm. because it's going to be difficult. She's going to be telling him what to do, and he's going to have figure out how to hold her at bay. Her and a bunch of other crazy people that are yeah. going to be in his caucus. Yeah. So I think, look, Nancy Pelosi has some people not as crazy as Marjorie Taylor Greene, but she has the very liberals, mm -hmm. the so-called progressives, who put the pressure on her, and she's managed them. She's managed them. They don't run her caucus, but she's had to deal with them. Uh, they weren't the ones that uh, interfered with her. Who was it? It was the moderates of so Jared Golden yeah. uh, teamed That's a good up point. With, with some, you know, a guy from New Jersey who wants to to get rid of the uh, the limit on uh, state and local tax deduction, and they um, and they delayed a vote on a very important bill. Uh, really, kind of that they were the they were the bomb throwers. It wasn't the uh, uh, the progressives who yeah. who went along with much smaller than they had you know proposed. Every step of okay, the way, okay. So they, they, they were so much of a problem. They were taking half a loaf all the way. Well, I think uh, you know historians are going to have to look at Nancy Pelosi and say what an incredible job she did holding together a coalition that um, was so diverse. Uh, and I don't mean just like racially; I mean uh, uh, ideologically. A lot of there's a big moderate group of Democrats. Yeah, there, there is, and and uh, and then there's a you know a very big group of progressives. Yeah. And um, and I don't know if you remember this, but but back in like uh, 2008, I wrote a column about um, how maybe we don't need parties anymore because look, uh, Obama was not the choice of uh, of the traditional Democrats, and and he got nominated, and John McCain was not the support, you know, the choice of the Republican base, and they have their own brand that was independent of their parties, and 
and um, and you called me up and told me what was wrong with that. I did. You did. You did. And you said, uh, uh, you know, in parliamentary governments, there's all these little parties, and they come together. Uh, to form a government, and in American politics, they come together under Democrats and Republicans, and, and uh, something that would be a, a small party in Israel is, is a wing of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, and, um, and I've noticed uh, over the years that you're right, and uh, that these coalitions are, um, we call them parties, but really they are uh, uh, the group that puts us in position to govern, you know, what, depending on your perspective, Republican or Democrat. And the Republican Party has been, in I don't know, the last 40 years or so, very uh, more uh, ideologically consistent uh, inside the party. And the Democrats have been um, more complicated. Um, and you have you have everything from like true conservatives to uh, socialists uh, under yeah. the same. And and they don't agree on every issue. And they, there's only a few issues that they all agree on. You um, know, I think that, that that's a, that's a good point. I remember when I was very active in politics yeah. in uh, in 1972. I was helping Muskie. I was traveling around the country, uh, who was running for president, and George McGovern beat him. And George McGovern's campaign rested on young, very liberal people post the war, and uh, they took over the party. Mm -hmm. McGovern, because he was in the left wing, he was a good guy. Mm -hmm. But his supporters were in the real left wing of the, re perceived to be in the left wing of mm -hmm. the Democratic Party. Because there were a lot of Democratic moderates. Yeah. He got nominated and he carried Massachusetts and the District of Columbia, got slaughtered. And, and running in 1972 against a guy who was already defending himself against the water of a break. The, the Watergate break-in, a crook, uh, a crook. I can say that he was, he was, <laughs> he was, he was a crook. So, Nixon was successful in many ways as president. He was a knowledgeable president. He he knew how to go about it, but he was a crook. And George McGovern, running against him, carried just the District of Columbia. Why? Because he was on a fringe. Mm -hmm. He he himself wasn't, but his supporters were. So. Yeah, yeah. That's a good lesson for everyone. Yeah. And it's, it, it, I, I, but, but actually, I don't think it's going to hurt the Republicans. They have these fringe candidates, although they, a lot of their fringe candidates didn't make it this time, did they? they no. No, they made it through the primaries. Uh, with, with Democratic help sometimes. I know. <laughs> I know. This is the... I'm, I'm sorry to see that strategy working because uh, it did work. It did work. They, uh, they said we're going to help. Sure, we're going to help these Repub Republicans nominate real wackos. Yeah, and that'll help us. And it did. Yeah, and they did rob, nom nominate some wackos, and some Democrats were able to win because they were running against a wacko. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, maybe, but uh, but you know, it was, where was it? Okay, I'm blanking on the name, but there was one of the um, the candidates who uh, a House candidate who had voted for impeachment and was in a tough primary, and the Democrats backed his opponent, who was an election denier, um, because they felt strategically. This was in Michigan, and the guy's yeah. name was Mayer, M E J E R, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, which um, you know, when you talk about how how are we ever going to like get out of this this tight polarization. Um, where you know people just go vote their party on every issue, um, that's not going to help. But the, Dem the Democrats Democrat took won. that seat. They did. The Democrats that seat. got that yeah, they seat did. because they were running against a wacko. Yep. Yep. And the Democrats helped get that <laughs> wacko. <no. laughs> yeah. Yeah. They said no. I don't. I agree with you. I don't. Uh, I don't uh, uh, approve of that. Do remember the Republicans did that here in. Uh, um, 2012, when Angus King was running, uh, they ran ads for um, uh, Cynthia Dill, yeah. and they said uh, she's the real progressive in the race. And they had com the comparison ads between her and Angus King that made him look more conservative. They did that, huh? Yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Didn't work, but it didn't work. No, I'm a, I, 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 I'm a, 
I'm not a journalist, so I can say this. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm a big fan of Angus King because I spent many years in Washington, and I grew up a lot there in, in the years I was there, and have great respect for for politicians who are thoughtful and intelligent and moderate in their views, and Angus King is all of those things. And so I'm a, a great admirer. So I'm proud when people say, oh, your, your senator is Angus King. I'm proud because he, it, he, 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 he is the, what I viewed as the norm, mm -hmm. as a guy who belongs in the Senate. Uh, not, not the fellow, the football player from Georgia. That yeah. isn't what I would call the norm. Uh, so, do you think he'll run again, Angus? I do. I'm hoping he will. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I think it's important for the Senate, frankly, because he's able to talk. He has a lot of r Republican senators who are friends of his, social mm -hmm. friends. He makes a point of keeping an apartment there mm -hmm. and not, you know, sleeping in his office or right, some of them right, do. Right, right just so he can socialize with a, a, a lot of them. So, no, I think he's a, a, a imp very important part of, uh, of the Senate. I think Mitch McConnell is, too, actually. I don't agree with Mitch McConnell on most anything, and I think it's terrible what he did with about uh, uh, the Supreme Court justice and not letting him have a hearing and so forth. I think that's just awful, and you go down in history uh, with a black mark for that. On the other hand, he is the type of senator in terms of wanting to protect the reputation of the Senate that is, you know, he's not like Angus King, but he's normal. You mm -hmm. don't think so, I can tell. Well, I think he's done a lot of damage, and um, uh, I guess I would say that the, the stuff with the judges, not just um, the um, Merrick Garland, uh, yeah. you know, stiff-arming um, Obama on, on Merrick Garland, but also... Uh, uh, changing the filibuster rule uh, for, Gor for Gorsuch yeah. um, and pretty much guaranteeing forever that they were never going to be a, um, a bipartisan uh, Supreme Court justice again because uh, you can only get uh, a justice confirmed under, under the new rules uh, if the president and the senator are in control of the same party and you only need um, uh, 50 votes. So... Um, uh, I don't think we're ever going to see a consensus Supreme Court justice. Uh, it's just going to be uh, one partisan after another because uh, of the short-term political gain that McConnell got from um, um, from leaving that nomination open uh, during the election, which I think really helped Trump, and then coming back the next uh, spring with a very um, uh, partisan judge. Um, that would never have gotten uh, um, 60 votes, uh, didn't even try to find a one that would. Um, and, and that sets the pattern going forward where, the, you know, I don't know what changes that. So I, I think that's, that's going to be a, a, a lot of damage. And also he's been one of the, the main advocates for uh, more money in politics. Like most people I talk to think there's too much money in politics, not Mitch McConnell. He wants more money. He he has fought every campaign. I think all the Republicans want more money in politics. Well, at least they most of them say you know they don't like it when the money gets spent against them. Well, after Citizens United, there was a bill in the Senate yeah. to uh, regulate it and to provide for full disclosure yeah. and all, all of that. Act, but yeah. we had two senators who voted against that bill, and they said for procedural reasons. They always yeah, yeah, say those always, things. Yeah. But they both voted against it. I think it's a Republican deal. Sure. And what we don't know about Mitch McConnell is what is the behind the doors conversation. He's very careful of his caucus. Like he doesn't ex doesn't want to make anybody take a bad vote. Right. Um, so he doesn't do things where um, he would let uh, like a group of Republicans vote with the Democrats. Um, and I, I assume the, the Democrats are, are the same way, uh, that they don't want to expose any of their members to a, a vote that would hurt them. So uh, they end up not voting on a lot of things. He has a Donald Trump problem, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good. He deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They both, they deserve they each other. They deserve each think. other. He brought, he, you know, he helped Donald Trump uh, put it, be in a position to, uh, to torture him. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, that's true. Oh, yeah. No. The, the hypocrisy, and mm -hmm. I'm going to say this, this is 
I, I, you know, the people look at me and they say, well, he's a Democrat because he says that he's partisan. I'm not. I'm a Democrat, but I'm not partisan. There are a lot of Democrats who disapprove of some of the things I, I say. But uh, I, 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 I'll tell you, the hypocrisy, um, because of Trumpism, because mm -hmm. of the, the unbelievable control this, this sickness called Trumpism has in the Republican Party, they're hypocrites. They're hypocrites. They say one thing. If they're running against them, they tell the truth. Uh -huh. But otherwise, they lie for him. Yes. And I, I think that's terrible. You know, the Founding Fathers, you do know this. I do. I know you know this. <laughs> but the Founding Fathers, and particularly Madison, who was the architect of the Constitution, felt it could only work well if you had a succession of virtuous leaders. There is no virtue among these, these hypocrites in Washington. No virtue. It's mm -hmm. dangerous. So mm -hmm. anyway, uh, thank you for coming on the show and let me make a little speech Very like that. Very good. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. So, uh, so what about um, what about our second district uh, race? Yeah. The Republican running again. I, I thought, gee, what is, why did the Republicans let this guy run? Here he is running in this. We talked about the demographics, an area with education, where there's some resentment, where there's some anti-elitism. Here's a guy, Andover, Harvard, and Wall Street, rich uh -huh. Wall Street, Harvard grad, running in that district. You wouldn't, if you were inventing a candidate to run there, he'd be the last one you'd get. I think so, and and he also, you know, he bigfooted um, uh, Trey Stewart, a uh, young state senator, out of that race. Oh, tell him what did we? Uh, got uh, you know, they, there was a before. Was that Clinton the guy from Presque Isle? Yeah, uh, you know, a young um, uh, second district legislator was w announced he was going to run against Golden, and um, and then there were some conversations, and um, and he said he was not going to run against Golden. You know, I think they gave him the kid. It's not your night. Uh, speech, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so he got out, and uh, I think that would have been a, um, a, a tougher race. And um, um, I was watching uh, the, the commercials during the World Series, and I, I noticed that Poliquin doesn't appear in any of his ads. It's all uh, these very harried people, you know, like, oh, everything's scary, everything, I liked it better before, uh, life is con too complicated. And, uh, and then at the end, I approve of this message. And, um, and uh, Golden's adds, uh, I thought he was running as Joe Biden. He doesn't mention Poliquin, he doesn't mention the Republicans, he just talks about, I stood up to Biden, I, I was the only one who voted against the, uh, the big uh, COVID relief bill. Um, so... You know, I guess that's that's you, you have to say what you want to get elected. But um, well, I think, I think we, the, the number that really jumps out at me in that race is that uh, uh, Tiffany Bond uh, got uh, seven percent of the vote, something like twenty thousand votes. Yeah, could that be right? Is that, I, 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 I don't I, know. I, but I might be off the math there, but but, but she got she got seven percent. Yeah, and it was solid seven percent all night long. Yeah, because uh, she'd have to because uh, Golden got forty eight percent of the vote. And uh, and he got forty-four. Poliquin got forty-four. Yeah. So that figures. And uh, uh, that's got to be a protest vote of some kind against uh, you know against Golden, I would think. Yeah. Because uh, uh, or people that can't, can't. Well, she's a Democrat. No, she, she's not. She used to be a Democrat, and yeah. now she's an independent. But she. Um, but there are uh, people that say I as, can't vote for a Democrat. As far as I know, the only campaign of hers that I ever was able to get a grip on was that. Uh, she was complaining about not getting covered in the media um, and not being invited to the debates and, and things like that. But she still got a substantial point of the amount of the vote, and she denied Golden a uh, election night victory. And I think he's going to win the runoff. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I think that's he should definitely see that as a as a message that, uh, especially if he's thinking about running statewide someday. All right. Then we'll ask you a question. We're going to run out of time. Yeah. The Democratic Socialists are good at organizing and getting the stuffs on the ballot, but the people spoke. They did. And uh, we, we were talking about this earlier. They kind of spoke in a, in a pretty articulate way. They, they, they didn't uh, just say no on everything or yes on everything. Um, uh, people 
seem to go through uh, the ballot, which is very complicated in Portland. There was something like um, uh, A to E on the charter and 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 one to five on um, on the questions, and and voted for some and voted against others, and the and the margin of victory is very similar. Uh, um, uh, it was about sixty forty. People thought it through. People huh? thought it through and came to the same conclusions. It make uh, you feel good groups. about it. It made me feel like people because <laughs> I saw that ballot. I said nobody's going to read that. It's three pages long. But the voters in Portland read it. The voters read. in Portland read it, and they didn't, they, I didn't agree on, on all the outcomes, but um, I, I don't have any doubt that people read that and took those, those questions seriously. You know, uh, Democratic Socialists is an interesting uh, thing you were talking about earlier about, about you know, feeling like they're, they're in a fringe of, or a wing of a party, and um, uh, if you talk to them, they, they feel like everybody really agrees with them, and um, uh, they just, it's a matter of getting their message out. And um, I think it's. Uh, I think right wing Republicans think the same thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I personally think the same thing. I think everybody agrees with me. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Except for some, a few cranks. But anyway, no, so it's a point of like, how do you build a coalition to get progress on some of these, um, on these plans? And, and they had success in the past of getting around the uh, legislative process and putting these things on the ballot and, and, and then forcing the, um, the council. To city council to, to implement them, yeah. and uh, now I think they really need to find a way to work within the council system. So what is it? So 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 what does this say that pe people didn't? Uh, what is this telling us that people really don't see a big problem with the governing structure of Portland? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what what it says. The the um, uh, the way the charter commission came about. In my recollection is that um, the the uh, clean elections people wanted to have a local clean elections referendum yeah. and the city told them you can't do that it has to be done through the charter so they went through the trouble of, of putting uh, the petitions out to get a charter um, review commission and then we had COVID and the George Floyd protests and and uh, a lot of um, street activism that latched onto the charter uh, commission as a vehicle for a lot of big change and I don't think that's what drove this was a need for for big change and i would just say one last thing before we go and in cape elizabeth where i live they voted down a proposal for a 115 million dollar school project too much money and they didn't like the way they went about it and the proponents would say i voted against it would say about me i don't like education i'm anti-education right, right right and that's the absurdity of american politics <laughs> thank you very thank much you, Al.